He's my buddy. I wouldn't be where I am today without him. And also... Well, I do owe him a lot. And it goes without saying. To be honest, I don't know him that well. I can say this, though. Annoying. So annoying. But... Abrasive. Obnoxious. Self-absorbed. What more can I say? He's... One more time. Boulder up the hill again. Legacy of Destruction releases on April 26th. Unlike its predecessor, Phantom Nightmare, this one's actually not very good. Shining Sarcophagus can't be destroyed by monster effects, search is a card that mentions it once a turn, and if your opponent reborns a monster, can pitch a spell card to send it back to the grave. Gadget Trio searches Shining Sark or a spell trap that mentions it on summon, and if it's destroyed, set Stronghold the Hidden Fortress from deck. Save us some time, it's a trap monster that gets kinda big and has a battle trick. Silent Magician Zero gains a level each time your opponent draws, gains 500 for each extra level it's acquired, and while you control Shining Sark, can negate a spell and gain a level. Silent Swordsman Zero gets a level once each standby phase, has the same attack boost, and can negate an effect that targets Sark or a card that mentions it. More Marshmallon is Marshmallon with glasses while you control Sark, can summon itself during the opponent's turn while you control Sark, and if it's destroyed, floats into another more Marshmallon. Gandora G, the Dragon of Destruction, summons itself if you control Sark, gains 300 for each banished card, and can pay half your life points to destroy and banish all cards on the field, then summon a Shining Sark associate from deck and give it an extra level for each card you destroyed. Future Silence searches a monster that mentions Sark, then if it's the battle phase and you have Sark up, both players draw to six cards. Turn Silence gives one of your monsters three levels, then if you activate it in response to a monster effect while Sark is up, that effect is negated. Also, it can banish itself from Graveyard during damage calc to end the battle phase. And Ties That Bind can summon two level 4 lower monsters that mention Sark while you control Sark and a friend of his, but you can't summon from the extra deck for the rest of the turn. Hard to judge this one fully. There is a clear game plan with plenty of one card starters, but the payoff is pretty much just a spell negate, a target negate, and then a good hand with more than one starter or a monster negate tacked on there. And yet, let's not downplay the possibility that Shining Sark's effect to send something back to Grave will come up, but of course you do need specific specifically a spell to discard, so on top of being pretty easy to play around, it also might just not be live at all. Gandora G is deceptively powerful, on top of his ability to clear your opponent's board, get really big really quick, and summon out a Silent Magician with a shit ton of levels to end the game. It also works as an E-Telly going first to get one of your negates up. If you draw into him, you can use your Gadget Search on turn silence, then use Gandora to kill Gadget and replace him with Magician. This will also trigger Gadget's effect to set Stronghold, but that leads us right into some of the more frustrating aspects of this archetype's design. From the effects of Gadget and Marshmallow, it's evident that there is an intent here to have Gandora pop things that then will float on destruction, but the only two in-theme options so far are some guys that are kind of hard to get over in battle. Maybe they want us to throw in like gold, silver, and platinum so that when you cut them open you get Trio and another search, but Trio being the only machine in the deck makes those cards only do anything proactively if you've already drawn Trio. Really anything you try to mix it with you're gonna end up in some strained lines to avoid killing too many of your own cards with Gandora, but also you have to kill at least some of them because he can't summon from deck unless he succeeds in destroying at least one card. And it can't even be the Sark that you just used to search Gandora because they were nice enough to give it protection from your board wipe. Blessing and a curse in some ways. The best attempt I've seen at making this deck work is as a minimum investment engine mixed with Horus so that you can consistently get to Magician, then use Gandora and Horuses to make Giant Trainer and try to draw some non-engine to support your modest end board. Tenpai Dragon Pydra searches or sets a Sangen spell trap on summon, nullifies the battle damage you take when your Fire Dragon monster battles, and Soft once per turn can quick effect Synchro Summon during either battle phase. Chundra is a tuner that summons itself if you control a Fire Fire Dragon, summons a level 4 lower Fire Dragon from deck at the start of the damage step, and also quick synchros during the battle phase. Fadra reborns a Fire Dragon on summon or at the start of the damage step, protects your Fire Dragons from being destroyed by battle, and you guessed it, 
quick synchros. Sun Genkaiman either searches a level 4 or lower fire dragon, special summons one from hand, or both if you activate it during the battle phase. Sun Gen Summoning makes your fire dragons unaffected by your opponent's activated effects during your main phase 1, can search a Tenpai then pitch a card each turn, and if it's destroyed during the battle phase can double the attack of a dragon synchro. Sun Genpai Biden Dragon is a synchro tuner that requires dragons, reborns a fire dragon on summon but locks you to dragons, and if 3 or more attacks have been declared this turn can quick effect reborn itself then pop a spell trap on field. Finally, Sun Genpai Transcendent Dragon makes all monsters on the field stand on business on summon, forces all your opponent's monsters to attack, locks them out of using any cards or effects during the battle phase, and if 3 or more attacks have been declared this turn can quick effect reborn itself and pop any card on the field. Neat new strategy, but unfortunately if you hadn't heard, the battle phase is over. Konami removed it sometime around 2017 for convenience purposes, so I can't really see how- What happened? Alright, let's get into the nitty gritty here. Tenpai is not just an OTK deck. It is the battle phase. It's so hopped up on battle damage it can see the future and navigate the depths of space with its psychic powers waging holy war against established boards. Normal summoning Pydra, which is searchable with both summoning and Kaimen, combos into 37,000 damage. They can kill you through prosperity twice and then one more on the chin just in case you weren't paying attention. This is accomplished through getting all three names on board to swing in with, quick synchroing into Biden to bring back Fadra, who will trigger to bring back Chandra, so now you've got three more attackers and material on board to make another 7 and a 10, which can be transcendent, but more likely will be Trident Dragion, a much older card who nonetheless is part of the team. His effect lets him pop two cards on summon to swing three times with its 3k, but don't forget, popping summoning will trigger it to double Trident's attack, meaning he represents 18,000 damage with a body that even the largest format threats can't block. In terms of breaking boards in preparation for the kill, Tempai is naturally quite proficient at it given the healthy redundancy in its surges and extenders, and summoning making your monsters unaffected by your opponent's negates long enough to make an unaffected Black Rose Dragon or Meteor Burst Dragon. But also the high consistency of finding one of your one card starters and very few engine requirements mean most Tenpai lists are capable of playing something like 25 non-engine. So even if your opponent is prepared to use their interruptions to stop your zero to death combo, odds are you can just hand trap them to death, right geki whatever they leave on board, then play through a negate because you just drew two searchers. Alright, I've got it. I'll just make them go first game two. This is where our story actually gets crazy. Tenpai will OTK you during your battle phase. Without adding any additional bricks to the deck, you can easily end on the strongest end board in the game's history, Seals Pass. And if your opponent makes the mistake of trying to attack over the Seals, it'll tribute itself and flow into Fadra, who will reborn the Chandra you used to make Seals, and climb through Bident into Transcendent, who will force everything they have on board to swing into it. Maybe it's an exaggeration to say you'll consistently die to this, but I hope the message is clear that even when forced to go first, they can still present a major threat with Seals backed up with all the hand traps they can draw. But then there's also the possibility of using your Tenpai starters to make Romulus, you operate more like a basic Dragon Link deck going first with rockets in the main deck to end on things like Boreland. Then there's the theory of using Bident and AFD to reach Zulkin, which you can even trigger on your opponent's turn by using Seals to summon Pydra and set from deck. Hey, let's talk about AFD. All your starters are also one card AFDs, and I don't just mean they summon AFD, I mean any of these cards you see on the screen gets you to a position in which AFD and a field spell are on the field at the same time. By comparison, Revolution Synchron, which for some reason we hyped up as a way to make AFD last year, is practically incompetent at it. You have to just already have a level 4 on board and a field spell on board. Those two can be connected, but it's entirely separate from the so-called AFD enabler. In the Zulkin build, they've been using this to search Necro Valley, which they can set to trigger Zulkin before activating as part of their end board, but also I guarantee the dude at your locals who either plays ABC or Generator is about to make some poor economic decisions for the third year in a row. Do not fucking ask me what this has to do with Nirvana High Paladin or Telephon FTK or why they fucking semi-limited Kaiser Coliseum. Just, just don't underestimate this deck. Alright, Ragnarika, the evil seed, can summon itself by pitching a plant, insect, or reptile, and on summon grabs two Ragnarika cards from deck or banishment, then banishes a card from hand. But you're locked to plants, insects, and reptiles for the turn. Samurai Beetle summons itself by bottoming one of your banished, this is too many words, they're called pirates now, and if it's linked off for a Ragnarika monster, reborns a level 4 or lower pirate. Armored Lizard summons itself by banishing a pirate from grave, and can discard one to bounce an opponent's monster, but not in the mirror for some reason. Bloom boosts pirates by 300, and docks everything else by 300, and once per turn either surges a Ragnarika, then discards a card, or summons a Ragnaraka from hand, grave, or banished. Hunting Dance pops a card your opponent controls for each pirate link you control of a different type, and if a pirate is destroyed, can banish itself to pop an opponent's monster. All the link monsters can reborn themselves by bottoming a pirate you control. Skeletal Soldier reborns a Ragnaraka. Mantis Monk banishes two pirates from grave to search a Ragnaraka trap. Chain Coils activates when your opponent uses a monster effect to make neither player able to activate monster effects in hand for the rest of the turn. And Stag Sovereign activates when your opponent summons a monster from deck or extra to pop two monsters on the field. Interesting idea 
that no one was really expecting. We got, what, 25 types? One of them doesn't count. We can divvy those up into eight groups of three. Give everyone a tri-type. Who wants rocks? These cards are pretty strong tools for link climbing and existing plant, insect, and reptile decks. Evil Seed is a strong normal summon, being able to grab two cards, and the downside being close to negligible because Bloom can get whatever Ragnaraka you banish from hand back to the field. Through this line, Seed on its own can represent four link material due to Beetle and Soldier's Reborn effects, which in engine means getting to Monk in the trap card. This also puts two plants and an extra body on board, meaning you can instead pivot to a Jasmine line to access any other plant engine you want, or you could pivot at the point you have two insects to Invincible Atlas and access a Bee Trooper engine. The link monsters all having the ability to trade one random guy on board to return to the field also adds an interesting new dimension to combo through. Once you go through them, at any point later in the turn, you can trade a single link material for two or three. This also gives you the ability to make chain coils and stag sovereign early in the turn, link them off to do other plays, then bring them back by giving up two random bodies you have no other use for. It's also great as a means of recurring your combo pieces, since at the end of the turn you can use Soldier to put a good draw back for the grind game, then ladder through the other three to put the whole suite of names back in your extra deck to be used on follow-up turns. The flashiest way to implement this ability that looked good in YouTube thumbnails is on Serpentine Princess, who you can get on board with Snake Rain and Pure Ogdotic Ingenuity, and will net you whatever level three or lower monster sounded funny in your head. Speaking of Bee Trooper and Ogdotic, these cards do something very special for them, giving them a good payoff that's more or less unique to them. And they are quite good as payoff, Stag Sovereign being a double pop, and Coils locking your opponent out of some of their most important options for extending as early as their very first play of the turn. Probably the smartest home for them is in plant decks like Trap Tricks and Sun Avalon, in which you can use Jasmine to get to seed and all the advantage that comes with it. Trap Tricks works well with them since all their cards fit within the pirate locks, and their own infrequent two-type lock only stops you from summoning the least important link monster. Having a normal trap is a huge plus, and while it may seem like a deck of half insects can't consistently make Jasmine, any Trap Tricks can become Sarah, so you can tank Choice Band Surging Strikes or use Jasmine from a board state of any three Trap Trixes. In Plant Link, they're... Okay. As a starter, Evil Seed can do like the Rosalina style line to make an early Jasmine into Lone Fire into Lokai with the bonus that you've got Skeletal Soldier and Grave for work with now, but sewing locks you into plants early enough in any combo that it's really unlikely you'll get any use out of the bigger links, so you're pretty much just ending on the same old board you normally would. I guess there's something to be said of having the ability to tuck your now 1 of dry ass back in the extra, or put back your Jasmines that you churn through quickly nowadays. Our other three candidates still have most, if not all, of their same old problems that the new end board pieces don't really fix. As a pure deck, there's not exactly enough names to do anything that you wouldn't just get better value out of in a larger combo pile. Tri Brigade wasn't built in a day. There's so many good ideas present in just this first wave that I think you've definitely got to keep this deck in mind as it gets new support or new shells to slot into. Gruesome Grave Squirmer is a level 100 fiend that can quick effect summon itself if you control a fiend, then can destroy a Ubel or monster that mentions it on your field, and can banish itself from graveyard to summon a 00 fiend from hand or graveyard. Nightmare Throne is a field spell that either searches or destroys any 00 fiend from deck on active activation, and if a U-Bell monster you control leaves the field by a card effect, you can add a U-Bell from deck or graveyard with a level 1 higher or 1 lower than that monster to hand, then summon it ignoring its summoning conditions. Hello viewer, for the past 7 seconds, you have been silently wondering why Nightmare Throne adds the monster to hand before summoning it. Hidden somewhere in the description of this video is a 3 page document going into expansive detail on the proper summoning rulings that have led to this card working the way that it does. Make sure to read it carefully because if you leave a comment asking about something that could be answered in the document. The toilet seat your ass cheeks are currently super glued to, with 15 kilograms of TNT in the bowl beneath you, will flush. And let's say it'll turn into your own. Nightmare Throne. These cards are huge boosts for Ubel's consistency and their capacity to build boards. Nightmare Throne gives you access to both of the best normal summons in the deck, Beckoning Beast and Lotus. You already wanted to open both of them as often as possible because Beckoning couldn't access any of your Ubel cards on its own, and Lotus didn't really end on much aside from Ubel favorite pass without Beckoning Beast getting you a bunch of free extra bodies, so having a consistency piece that can get to either of them is a huge step up for the deck. But also the ability to destroy Spirit from deck, triggering its effect to summon Ubel, opens up several lines that don't even go through Lotus, who can lose pretty harshly to hand traps. By leading with Beckoning Beast, you can set up Gin Buster and then use the opening effect to bring back the spirit you popped from deck, getting you your search for Nightmare Pain, protection from all manner of rocks and blossoms, and two fiends on board ready to make Yama. If you want to search an extender, look no further than Squirmer, whose effect to summon himself is as generic as they come, and with a completely optional self-pop attached to it, he can be used to stop spirit from being hit with Imperm or do more complex things like get Terror and Karn in the graveyard early, so that when you want to summon it with Throne, the add to hand doesn't get blocked by Droll. And the graveyard effect extends your plays even further, getting back things 
things like Spirit to ladder through your U-Bell floats again, or to get your place started in lines that start with Throne Popping Spirit. The summon effect of Throne might seem odd because most U-Bells already float into the next level up, but Spirit breaks that pattern, so popping Spirit while Throne is up will let you float into two bodies instead of just one. It also lets you float even if your U-Bells get taken out some other way, like getting hit with Nib or fused away with Super Poly. Since Squirmer mentions U-Bell, you can consistently access him through Nightmare Pain, which is still your best search with Spirit because, unfortunately, Throne does not mention U-Bell. It mentions U-Bell monsters. Imagine being the idiot that gets screwed over by that ruling, right, Ghost Rare Eye of Tamias that I own? So yeah, you won't have access to pretty much the best card in your deck every single game, but even without it, the deck now has the gas to do some strong 1 and 2 card combos through Hand Trap that end on boards of Apollo, Soul of Rage, and this Rank 10 that I haven't talked about yet because, unfortunately, I have to talk about the cards in some sort of order. And it usually makes more sense to get through the archetypes before the free agents. Trust me, if I had my way, these videos would be written in the non-linear language of the aliens from Arrival. Last thing to note about Nightmare Throne is that it searches both Kepler and Copernicus, making it an option for DDD as well. Just the first of possibly many other decks with 0-0 Fiends worth playing a searcher for. Refrain, the Melodious Songstress, searches a Melodious Monster on Summon, and if a Melodious Fusion is summoned while it's in the extra deck, can go to the scale. As a spell, it can mill a Melodious Monster to give a Melodious Fusion 200 attack times that monster's level. Couplet can reveal itself from hand when it's searched to summon a level 4 lower Melodious from hand or graveyard. It also goes from the extra to scale when a Melodious Fusion hits the board, and in the scale it can search a Melodious Spell Trap. Concerto, Fusion summons any fairy using materials from hand, field, or your pen zones, and if a Melodious Fusion goes to the graveyard, can bottom itself from grave to draw a card. <laughs> is a fusion of two Melodiouses that prevents your Melodious fusions from having their effects negated, summons a Melodious from deck on summon, and reborns a Melodious when it's sent to the graveyard. Flowering at 12, the Melodious Magnificat is a fusion of a Maestra and two Melodiouses that can phase out any number of Melodiouses you control to quick effect bounce up to that many cards your opponent controls. And when she's removed by your opponent, she summons any Melodious except herself from deck or extra. These cards do just about everything you could ever ask for in a modernized take on Melodious. Not only are there more starters than ever, but there's some real payoffs that give the deck something to do going first. Etoile is a fantastic end board piece that can wipe entire boards mid-combo, and can even avoid Nibiru since whenever the rock comes down, she can tag out your whole field and bring the whole band back in the end phase. Outing her or any part of the board is tricky enough as is with things like Aria and Elegy up, but even once you manage it, she can float into Bloom Diva, an even bigger boulder to get up the hill. Baka is an incredible new fusion you can make with Ostinato, Soprano, or Concerto, an invoker that can't be Ash that gets you a body back when you link her off for Harmonist or fuse her away for a bigger fusion. Since her materials are just two names, she's perfect to summon with Ostinato. Nato, giving you the room to mill whichever two you want and craft your combo around that. And for your summon from deck, Refrain can be used to grab Couplet, who will reborn one of the materials used for Baka, then can be set in the scale to search Concerto. Refrain and Couplet work well with Concerto since it can send them from the front or back row to the extra deck and immediately trigger them to go back to the scales. And once she's in the scale, Refrain can mill yet another Melodious of your choosing that you can summon with Baka or add back to hand with Chapina or Soprano to later be Pendulum summoned. Although Ostinato and First Movement still aren't searchable because they aren't Melodious cards, the deck has enough one card combo between them and Refrain, as well as some two-card combos with Couplet that the deck can consistently end on a Toile and one or two Schubertas, as well as a pretty solid number of hand traps since you can draw a card with Concerto along the way, and with Fusion Sub and builds that choose to play Tam Tam, who for your consideration is also a time card. Since your whole deck is fairies, some of those hand traps can even be heralds, but uh, don't expect them to have the same amount of oomph that you might have gotten used to from the era of Orange Light Pitch and Guido. There's also been some experimentation in the OCG with using Ostinato to summon Baka and set up Beyond the Pendulum, pivoting into things like Full Pen Combo, Shad All Bullshit, and I swear to god I'm not making this up, Full Math Mech Combo under Apollosa. Kind of reminds me of old super heavy combos where like you could make an early Baron I will remember you. and then make a rank 4 to pivot in whatever the fuck else your deck does. Ostinato and Refrain both work as starters, but Refrain is way worse to lead with, so I don't know, I don't think that's gonna catch on. Lightsworn Dragonling summons itself from hand if there's a Lightsworn in your graveyard, mills a Lightsworn on summon, and if it's sent to the graveyard, searches a dragon monster with 3000 attack and 2600 defense, and that's literally just the two it's supposed to search. Weiss, Lightsworn Archfiend, is a level 4 tuner that can place a Lightsworn from hand on top of the deck to summon herself, then mill two, and when she's milled, you can reborn a Lightsworn. Aegis is a hot red for each Lightsworn, you control and sets itself after being milled. Minerva, the Athenian Lightsworn, protects your Lightsworns from being banished, mills Lightsworns on summon up to the number you use to summon her, and can banish up to four Lightsworns from graveyard to mill that many cards off the top. Enlightenment Dragon must be summoned by banishing one Judgment and one Punishment, one from field and one from graveyard, can quick effect pay 2k to banish both fields and both graveyards, and if it's destroyed by your opponent, adds both materials back to hand from banished, then summons them ignoring their summoning conditions. Hello viewer. 
Do you still have that document open? Lot to like about this new wave of support. Right on the surface, these cards have the highest level of control over what you're milling. We've seen to date in the Light Sworn archetype, except that one guy we don't talk about anymore. Dragonling and Minerva both let you pick exactly what you want to send from deck, and Weiss lets you pick a card from hand to be your first mill. This turns your bricky, inconsistent wolves and felises into much more control over resources you can get out at will from hand or deck. Dragonling checks all the boxes to be a circular, even though he does them out of order, and gives the deck access to its feathered bosses with the most consistency we've seen since Eclipse Wyvern bit the bullet. Minerva also perfectly sets up Punishment Dragon, getting all four names you need in the Banishment quicker than ever before. Aegis is a good possible interruption, but there's still not really Light Sworns that feel right to end on, so to enable it, you'll kinda just be leaving up random stuff to get in a gate or two. And Enlightenment Dragon is confusing. I mean, it's an absurdly strong interruption, wiping out everything your opponent could have possibly set up and leaving no survivors, but also wiping out your entire follow-up. Since you're only guaranteed to search one of the two materials with Dragonling, you'll need to go balls to the wall with your setup turn to ensure you mill the other one. But that means if you fire them off, you'll have maybe 10 cards in deck on turn 3 to try to assemble a new board to kill with. You can use Punishment to put it all back in the deck, except for all the Lights ones, but unless you've got another copy on you, the one you fused away is only coming back if your opponent destroys Enlightenment. So I guess when it comes to both Aegis and Enlightenment, the answer is that they really want you to just leave Minerva and a couple other random Light Sworns on board that can't be banished by your dragon. The smarter answer, I think, is probably just don't bother with Enlightenment. Both the big dragons are bricky, so only having to play one to get value off Dragonling's search is probably better. Judgment is fine as an extender, but Punishment is just as easy to summon with Minerva and is actually a really strong grave disruption in his own right. Anyway, probably your best bet for building Light Sworns is going to be something involving Bestial, so all your level 4 tuners can be used to make Baron. Dispater. You could also use some of them to make a new sort of tier lament brew, but nothing really jumps out as a good niche the deck can occupy on its own. With the amount of eights you go through, it's not hard at all to make two twelves and thus calamity lock, but as Dimax pointed out in his article, there's really no reason to try and fit into the format space that Centurion has a straight monopoly on. I don't know, maybe we really will end up as Aegis plus punishment mid-range instead of the mill 30 combos we're expecting. God, we're on page eight already. Do you think I can get away with saying Ancient Gear is still bad and moving on? Centurion Gargoyle II is a level 8 that summons itself by sending a face-up Centurion card to the graveyard, comes back to hand when it's used as Synchro Material, and can summon itself out of the back row while it's a trap card and decrease its level by 4. Wake Up Centurion is a quick play spell that, while you have a monster in the back row, summons a token of level 4 or 8 and can banish itself from graveyard to mill a Centurion card. Centurion Auxilla protects your face-up back row from being destroyed, surges a Centurion card on summon, and during the end phase, places a Centurion from graveyard or banished, in your back row as a trap. These cards add even more options for Centurion to extend through interruption, with more ways to summon bodies of precisely the levels you need for your different plays. More ways to a non-tuner 4 in engine makes it easier to do level 8 synchro plays like Packbit, but the real star of the show in more ways than one is Auxilla. While it doesn't do much of anything when it's summoned on your opponent's turn, like Legadia, in practically every other respect, Auxilla outclasses her predecessor. Rather than a random draw off the top, Auxilla can grab one of your archetypal traps, adding an extra point of interaction to your existing one-card combos. And the combo doesn't really change at all from that point forward because they ripped Legatia's place from Graveyard wholesale onto her replacement, and then one-upped it by letting it place from Banished, keeping your Primera from being spirited away by Abysteel. And to top it all off, Auxilla also protects your backroad Centurions, keeping you even safer from removal than you already were. Want more? Unlike Legatia, Auxilla is dark, meaning that her and Crimson Dragon can't be super polyed into Mud Dragon, a common fate for a board with Legatia. Similarly, being a dark dragon makes her a target for Shadow's Light, to summon the opposite attribute but same type Crimson Dragon for absolutely free. She also makes Waka Ushi into a much better one-card combo, rather than going through Banshee to find a starter, or go through Enchurning Entrainment to make an extra 12, you now get to do both, making Auxilla grab whatever starter or extender you like the best, then using that starter to make a turn 1 Crimson Dragon, either fire it off turn 1 to add Blazer to your end board, or hold it to use in your opponent's draw phase, giving them far fewer chances to play before Calamity hits the board, and leaving your summon with stand-up free to use on Algadia. But that brings me to my larger, more schizophrenic point. If Waka Ushi is a one-card full Centurion combo, what else is? With the bare minimum engine required of one stand-up, one Primera, and one Gargoyle, any deck capable of making a single 12 now has a pipeline to Crimson Dragon and King Calamity. As a Dark Dragon, Auxilla can even be made in Resonator, bringing us full fucking circle and putting Calamity back in the Red Dragon Archfiend deck. Calamity was of course banned in the OCG before these cards came out, so the TCG is the last testing ground we have left for the designers to absolutely beg us on their hands and knees to break King Calamity, while we continue to go, eh, it's kinda bricky, loses all sorts of outs, I still think I Pete Baron. I will 
clears. Momentum Plan Fusion is a quick play fusion spell for any fusion monster as long as you use at least one memento, and can shuffle back material from graveyard if one of your mementos was destroyed this turn. You can also banish it from graveyard and destroy a monster you control to search your memento spell or trap. Memento Plan Twin Dragon is a fusion of two mementos that banishes any monster your mementos run over in battle, destroys a memento from hand or field on summon to search two memento monsters, and if it's destroyed, reborns a level 6 or lower memento. These cards fix up mementos draw the field spell or die strategy, giving you the connective tissue, so to speak, to search all the important pieces along the way starting from just one card. With just Anguish, Dark Blade, or Tatsu, you can get to a position of Mace popping itself to search Fusion, turning on its Miracle Contact mode, and getting you to Twin Dragon's double search using recycled material. And like Gaddick, Twin Dragon comes with an effect to reimburse you after destroying him to pay for an effect. So when you use Fusion's graveyard effect, shooting him in the head to get the field spell, he'll bring back something to further extend your combo. From this line, you can end on a board with Combined Creation, one of the traps, Mace in hand, and an IP or SP depending on how much you fear God. You can also adjust the line to make use of the two fiend monsters in the deck to make Yama and end on a soul of rage and escape. Or you could trade out your set trap for a set fusion, letting you make things like Guardian Chimera on your opponent's turn. If you make Twin Dragon this way, you can kill your Horn Dragon to get two searches, then trigger it to pop two of your opponent's cards and your Twin Dragon, which can then float into Anguish for yet another search, maximizing your interrupts and follow-up. Celatris Valmonica searches a Valmonica card when it's normal or pendulum summoned, and if it's sent to the graveyard and you have two Valmonicas in the scales, returns to the hand. Valmonica Invitare either summons a Valmonica from deck, but locks you to only using the effects of Valmonica monsters for the turn, or if you control a non-pendulum Valmonica, adds a Valmonica pen to your hand and one to your extra deck. Disharmonia places a resonance counter on whichever scale you want, then either gains 500 and adds back a banished Valmonica, or takes 500 and adds back a Valmonica from the graveyard. With this new support, Valmonica finally feels like it has some amount of direction in terms of how you're supposed to play it. Celatris searching any card gives you a much clearer link between the highly searchable monsters and the spells they rely on. Celatris searching Invitare gets you to both a name and hand to set scales with, and one in the extra to Pendulum Summon that can then copy one of your spells in the grave. And if you already have scales set up, you can Pendulum out both names to copy two spells. Celatris' effect to return to hand combos perfectly with Angelo and Demona's effects to pitch a card to set scales, since you'll see on Resolution of the Chain that you have both names in the pen zones and jump right back to hand, from which you can be Normal Summon to grab Celta, which will search Invitare, getting you to that board with both copy effects ready to be used. Another perk of this recursion effect is the ability to summon her with Invitare's less desirable e telly effect, link her for Artemis, and in doing so get her back to hand to normal summon. Although the deck still doesn't have one card combo since you still kind of need a way to get to one of the pens and a way to Celta, the complex web of searchability gives you several two card lines that can end on Zebufera with a trap engraved to copy, and maybe even one on field, as well as an IP and the field spell that can use its steal effect when the trap gaining you life points puts a third counter on Angelo. And it's easier to control that interaction than ever with this Harmonia. First of all, both effects being around the same strength, brilliant. Thank you. Keep doing that. But also, independently placing a counter on whichever one you want before doing anything else gives you much better control on the number of counters on each scale. Normally, Angelo only gets, like, one. And only from your other Angelo in the monster zone copying a gain life effect because it has no other choice than to use the gain life effect. Now you can easily put that second counter on it so it can consistently gain the third counter during your opponent's turn. And getting that third counter also enables your IP to link yourself into Duralume, popping pretty much all your opponent's monsters, presuming you'll have at least three counters on each scale by this point. The support has really steered the whole ship back on course, where before we weren't even sure it could float. To the point where the deck has already started doing pretty well on the OCG as a slower control strat with a good amount of non-engine space. Sephira, Divine Dragon of the Voiceless Voice, draws two and discards one on summon if you control low, rips a random card from your opponent's hand when your light warrior dragon ritual battles, and during your opponent's end phase adds a light monster from graveyard back to hand. Blessing of the Voiceless Voice can add a Voiceless Voice card from graveyard or banish back to hand, and if a non-ritual summon can perform a ritual summon of a light warrior or dragon and make that monster unable to be destroyed by battle. Sephira, I mean, it's just not very good. It's cute that she can do all three of old Sephira's effects in one turn, but they're still not really that great. Drawing cards in a Control deck is okay, but it does conflict with Pros. Hand rip in the battle phase, I mean, come on, man. Airbellum is down the hall and to the left. And I guess you can grab Diviner back during your opponent's end phase for follow-up, or maybe like Valor. Four out of ten, I will not play you. Blessing, on the other hand, has become a standard one of in Voiceless Voice builds for its utility in some two-card combos and mid-game scenarios. For one thing, it's just nice to have a third thing to place with low, because currently, once you've got Barrier and Radiance up, you'll find yourself on turn three and beyond just 
placing extra barriers to get extra value off of low, which, you know, has its purpose. The more copies you have, the harder it is to ever get to a scenario where your monsters can be targeted, aiding in the sticky aspect of VV's board. But Blessing really serves a purpose from turn 3 and beyond, recurring spent resources that the deck otherwise runs out of quickly, like copies of Dragon Queen and Prayers. Prayers was an especially sore spot for the deck because once you banish both your copies, you could get into a position where you just run out of ways to ritual summon in the late game. And Blessing, of course, gives you yet another remedy for that issue as a continuous means of ritual summoning once each turn. And during your opponent's turn as well, since it will trigger when your opponent summons something, letting you add a Soravis or Pendulum Graph to your board, while also triggering Lowe's Resummon to get to Radiance. These interactions have enabled a two-card combo with Lowe and Skull Guardian, where you link off Lowe for Link Rebo, Blessing to add back the Lowe, then make Secure Garden to trigger Blessing to summon Skull Guardian. All told, it's kind of a minor incremental upgrade to an already sufficiently competitive deck. Nightmare Apprentice can summon herself by pitching a card, has the Illusion gimmick that they won't give up on, and searches any Illusion monster on Summon. Well, fuck me, I I guess. When I called it concerning that there was a card that searched any illusion right when the type was starting to take form, they decided to dig in even harder into it. There must be some sort of schism in the R&D department over whether they should be running illusion as an actual type or just a gimmick of the Chimera archetype. For now, it's still the latter, and this card is of course pretty good for it. Functionally sign at mining for Mirror Sword and Cornfield, this card adds more starters to the deck and makes for a good search with Gazelle that can add a body to the board, changing your Guardian Chimera options while also grabbing follow-up. Also, she's a level 6, so in the occasional hammer you don't get Get locked to fusions, you can end a turn by overlaying her and one of your chimeras into Beatrice to CRAP! I want Code of Souls, a level 3 fire cybers that can summon itself. How original. Hey Squidward, shut the fuck up. If you control a Link monster, lets you reincarnate a solid Link once each turn, and can quick effect banish itself to Link summon a Link 3 or higher cybers. Pyro Phoenix truthers, our time is motherfucking now! Do 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 do! Do, 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 do. This card is a huge buff to Salad, giving them an extra way to reincarnate alongside Sanctuary, and a way to reincarnate on your opponent's turn, letting you do things like shuffle away a back row with Heat Leo, get another search with Raging Phoenix, or of course... Ops wanted some initiative. Blew up their entire quadrant. <laughs> I'm moving like Oppenheimer. Making both Raging Phoenix and Pyro Phoenix in a single turn isn't that complicated since you can reincarnate Raging to get the search, then link it off with Princess to end on your bomb. The problem is, of course, that Code isn't a salad himself. You have mining and debug for him, but outside of those, the only consistent way to access him is through Horse Prince. Ugh. On the bright side, the deck does have its own tuners to make Horse Prince with these days, and if you don't need him to grab Code, he can summon Ash so you can add it to hand with Sunlight Wolf later in the turn, or just grab Gazelle so you can focus your search power on other combo pieces. Supreme King's Arc Synchro Universe is a level 12 Synchro that requires Dark Pendulum non-tuners and is treated as Arc while on the field, and I swear to you, that is the only line of text you need to know about. This card solves the issue plaguing Odd Eye's Arc Ray Dragon of being unreasonably difficult to summon because the original's Arc is just not feasible to make turn 1 even if you can tag him into Arc Ray for a super generic scale search. By comparison, Synchro Universe is a thousand times easier to make, so that makes Arc Ray playable, right? WRONG! You're not going to believe this, but a level 12 Synchro that isn't even generic is actually still pretty difficult to summon. The list of level 8 Dark Pendulums to tune with the level 4 tuners Pendulum Magician commonly plays is a lot less expansive than you might expect. So the lines I've seen have been all manner of cope, ranging from biting the bullet and just using two Dark Worms, to incorporating a Preta Plant engine because of Triantis. And regardless, what's the payoff for putting yourself through all that? A search? 90% of the time you're not even making Synchro Universe until after Pendulum Summoning, so you'll have to clear out one of your pen zones and have something pretty spectacular waiting to be tutored out if this is really the line you want to take with this deck. I think I'm realizing more and more that it wasn't really Zark's fault that Arcray was too hard to summon. Arcray is just dog shit. I feel like you could print a normal summon that can tag into him and he'd still be kind of mid. Probably the only cool thing he ever accomplished was being part of this transition that I had in my head for six months before pulling it off in the Yegov video. Vodadras, the final bringer of the end times, is a rank 10 that can quick effect detach to negate an opponent's card, then detach an extra material to destroy a card in the field. It also pops a card when it attacks and when it's destroyed. Obviously a rank 10 Omni is extremely strong, although whole level 10 archetypes aren't exactly common. It'll for sure open up some lines for Earth Machine in hands where they can get to the material before being locked, and maybe come up in decks like Eldlich and Nemliria. The real deck to watch out for this card in, though, is Ubel, where frequently you can get to both a copy of Original and Spirit to add a big, beefy Omni Negate to your board of mostly monster disruption. The pop attached to his Negate being free to go after whatever you want makes it profitable to negate a normal spell that's leaving the field anyway, then destroy a permanent on board, getting practically double the value. And you can even get a disruption off the last effect by ending on Abyss Actor Super Producer, which can quick effect pop a face-up card to control, and then optionally do some Abyss Actor bullshit that you don't actually gotta do. He's already seen 
a bit of play in Unchained as an option to go into for a free pop during either turn, and playing him opens up some lines in Ubel that play well into Nib, so it's not too bad of an idea to save an extra deck space for him, and sometimes be able to end on him with Vardardross so you can trigger it to pop an opponent's card. Blink Out is a quick play spell that bounces a Link monster on the field, then can special summon one of its Link materials from your graveyard. Smart move from Konami not letting it summon all of the materials. I can't imagine the EDO Pro replays that would be farmed from a fully fledged D Link row. Instead, it takes more inspiration from Defusion being a decent removal tool and interruption to use on your opponent's Link monsters, just telling them to fuck off back to where they came from real quick. A fun use case for it is if your opponent stole your monster with tactics, then linked it off, you can out their Link monster and get your guy back in the process. It's also like, okay in conjunction with Link 1, since then the sort of trade your guy for monster reborn aspect of it isn't so minus. Maybe you want to make Marinsa Sea Angel early so you can get to your spell, then blink it out to get the material back to make Blue Slug. I don't know if that could even possibly come up, why are you asking me? Not really a big deal. Metal Tronus summons a monster from hand deck or extra that shares at least two of these stats with a monster your opponent controls, negates both the summon monster and the opponent's monster, then if they have the same name, banishes them face down, and your opponent cannot activate their monster in response. Another quick play one for one removal tool, Metal Tronus is odd. Much stronger in the mirror, but also forcing you to give up your own bosses to get the most value out of it. You can remove Baron uh. by summoning your own and then banishing them, but then you don't have your own Baron anymore. So maybe it's just good as a negate that also extends for you. I guess negating your opponent's Flamberge and summoning your own puts you in a pretty good position. Being a little bit spell speed 4 is cool. Maybe this would have peaked in like Prank Kid format where you could negate Battle Butler and summon Fancies to start your own combo right off. Very funny it has to be a non-token monster so you can't target the Primal Being token and summon a second Nibiru. Diabell Star lore update. Snake Eyes Diabell Star is Konami's latest innovation in making cards that are completely impossible to talk about without just saying the entire card name, breaking up the flow of your sentence with six fuck-ass syllables, and somehow still not being understood. When she battles, she can place herself and the monster she's battling into the back row as continuous spells, and while she's there, you can target a fire in your graveyard, place it in the back row, and summon her. This card has seen a lot of play in pure Snake Eye variants, since she can be placed in the back row with Divine Templar Dramatic Chase. Her existence makes both of them into actual proactive extension instead of just an extra resource waiting to be unlocked later. She's also the second search target for Wanted, so if you open Wanted and Black Witch, you can search Snake Eyes, pitch it for Black Witch, then later in the turn use Poplar or Flamberge to place her from the grave into the back row to use her free summon. That also makes both of them even better in the grind game since they both can put a monster on board with their place effects much more quickly than usual. Doesn't usually make the cut in Fire King builds, but she definitely adds a lot more options to the already incredibly strong Snake Eye archetype. Diabelle's The Original Sin Keeper is an illusion without the illusion effect that they actually are are giving up on that can summon herself if there's a sinful spoils in either graveyard, makes your opponent unable to activate any spell or trap cards that weren't set first, and if a player sets a spell trap, can target a card on each field and destroy them. Sinful spoils struggle can destroy cards on your field up to the number of sinful spoils in your graveyard and banished, and cards on your opponent's field up to the number of theirs. And if it's destroyed or banished by your opponent while set, it can shovel two cards on the field back into the deck. Sinful spoils of Dozing Morian can book a special summon monster, and if you control level 5 or higher illusion, can reset itself. And sinful spoils sub duel either searches or summons a level 5 or higher illusion, but if you summon it, it can't activate its effects during the main phase this turn, and can banish itself from graveyard and bounce a set card you control, then let you set a spell trap. So start off with the obvious, Morian is kinda whatever. It's competing with like Silvera and Arciella's interruptions you can set with Black Witch, and it's okay. Struggle is painfully reactive, only doing anything in matchups where your opponent is on Sinful Spoils too, so one might view it as a way for Snake Eye to like Bully, Rescue Ace, and TG and shit. And Subduel is of course your main way of finding and enabling Diabells. Summoning her with Subduel makes her mostly unable to use her pop that turn, but her Floodgate will still be active and the graveyard effect of Subduel can proactively trigger her pop on a later turn. If you draw into Diabells in a hand that already has Black Witch access, you can summon her for absolutely free and in doing so turn off infinite impermanence for one thing. I know one guy who's happy about that. On your opponent's turn, they'll be unable to use quick play spells or set scales, so Runic and Pendulum fans are already calling for this card's immediate extermination. But she's not a full anti-spell. If your opponent wants to use a spell like Rhoda, they just have to set it first and then flip it right up. That's where the pop comes in, giving you a chance to predict whether you think the spell that's just been set is a threat and neutralizing it before it gets flipped up, making her kind of like a spell negate in a stripped down sort of way. But of course this opens up the mind games of, is this set spell what I think it is? Is it the card they just searched or a complete bluff? This doesn't however apply if the set spell is original sinful spoils, and it was set by Black Witch, because although it has broader application, this too is a card designed for the mirror. I mean, come on, your opponent can't use quick plays? Like, wanted. I'm starting to get the sense that Konami might just be a little embarrassed of this lore arc they've embarked on. Like, they didn't mean for it to immediately revolutionize the game on release, and just like their last lore arc, create a tier zero deck in the second leg of the story. So now they're trying to make support for the deck that's also anti-support, but they can't make it too good at that either, or... 
I don't fucking know. Diabelle's has not seen very much play in Snake Eye so far, but you better believe they're playing her in Chimera because she's an illusion monster that does something. You can get her into rotation with Gazelle, Apprentice, or Mythical King, then use King of Phantom Beasts or Big Wing to summon her, from which point she'll shield you against stuff like Evenly or Called By, and be able to pop something when your opponent tries to use a spell card. That's kind of it. There's no card for me to go insane about this time, although from a certain point of view, I kind of went insane about every card this time because how the hell did I write 700 words about Light Sworn? I sometimes wonder if my work is unsustainable, if I can really expect to get an adequate understanding of a hundred cards every three months, not even factoring in side sets. I mean, there literally were no new cards in between Phantom Nightmare and Legacy of Destruction. I had the most time I've ever had to research for this video. Still worried about it every single day. I'm worried right now writing this, thinking somehow every single segment is too short, not in depth enough, probably outdated somehow. Maybe I'm worried that you guys won't watch a video called Everything You Need to Know if I don't know everything. There's a lot of things I don't know. I don't know how many more of these I have in me. I don't know if I'll ever make a video that does as well as Power of the Elements again. I don't think it matters. But right now I'm not going anywhere. I keep working my ass off to try and share as much knowledge of this strange, spectacular game as I can with this world. Because if I don't, who will? I mean, maybe Josh will.